anyone that is back with us or joining for the first time today. As a reminder, we did send out an email early this morning for all those that had registered, if you had registered by at least last night. We got an email this morning as a reminder, but also if you missed the recording last week, I think we had some excellent discussion with our Oklahoma Youth Expo uh, leadership and um, really what the focus of, um, of, of Youth Livestock Exhibition is really supposed to, supposed to be about. So Dr. Lohman, I'll, I'll let you um, say hello, Dr. Beck can say hello, and then we will turn it over to Dr. Henley. I'll be brief. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, <clears throat> I hope we got the reminders. If you registered, hopefully we got that reminder fixed. So you got an email reminder about today. I know that's real helpful to me. Uh, most everyone here on the panel uh, are part of the Extension Network. I just want to mention that the OSU Extension. Uh, we're part of the you know, there's an office in every county and we have very livestock specialists that are available to answer your questions. So we just want to make sure that you recognize that part of our OSU extension educational uh, efforts. So welcome and uh, Dr. Biggs, I'll let you cover the survey and the things you want to say. All right, uh, Dr. Beck, if you want to say hello, I will take it after you. All right, thank you, Dr. Biggs. Really appreciate everybody taking time out of their beautiful uh, sunny day we have to uh, uh, attend this conference or, or this lunchtime series. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing the, the talks and I'm sure y'all are too. Thank you very much. All right, with that, uh, I'm Rosalind Biggs. I'm also a beef cattle extension specialist with Oklahoma Cooperative Extension as well as uh, the College of Veterinary Medicine. And so again, we're excited to have you. And um, I will let Dr. Henley do the introductions of our, our two panelists today. Uh, I'm not sure within the show cattle industry, if, if you've had any length of time in the show cattle industry or exposure, uh, they probably don't need an introduction, but uh, we're excited to, to have them here today. And uh, I'll turn it over to you, Parker. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dr. Biggs. Uh, again, I'm looking forward to a Another really uh, good discussion today. Uh, last week was a lot of fun and we had a lot of participation with uh, uh, the attendees. And so feel free to uh, send some messages in the, in the chat box. Uh, I think Kirk, there's already one there uh, with a testimonial to one of your camps and uh, maybe an injury at that point. But uh, we'll try to get to those as we go along. Um, but as I introduced myself last week, my name is Parker Henley and uh, I'm an assistant professor here in animal sciences. And uh, my main focus is coaching the livestock judging team, but also uh, do some things like this as well. Uh, speaking with us today also is uh, Dr. Mark Johnson, a former uh, Tadashak endowed chair, livestock judging team coach and multiple other titles that we could add to his name. Uh, kind of the, the do it all around here. Uh, a guy that's been extremely successful at marketing purebred livestock. Uh, and then as a show dad, as his girls kind of end their career here, uh, they've racked up several wins uh, on the breeding cattle side uh, and, and has been an exceptional feeder uh, and home for that. The other uh, person that's going to discuss and jump in is uh, my good friend, Kirk Steerwalt. Uh, yep. I don't really have to give much of an introduction to Kirk. I'm sure everybody knows him, uh, but uh, Kirk does a little bit of everything. Uh, his history with show cattle uh, dates all the way back uh, to the, the 80s and uh, maybe late 70s in there too. And we're gonna have some cool pictures of that here in just a little bit, but a uh, great mind that's been around it uh, and uh, has given these kind of presentations all across the country. So. Enough talk, enough talk about us. Let's get into some of the, the discussions we're gonna have today. So, you know, the title of this talk uh, we're gonna have is uh, Keep It Simple, it, it's just, or it's still beef. And uh, I think that's very important. And so um, as we think about you know, nutrition and management uh, of show cattle, um, I think it's important that we discuss things 
<clears throat> excuse me, like what's your goal? And uh, if you think about goals of, of feeding livestock, if we think about it on the feedlot side, it's pretty easy. Um, we are trying to maximize a feedlot steer's intake, and we're trying to make them as efficient as we possibly can to reach a targeted fat thickness uh, as quickly as possible. Maybe on the cow herd side in production, we're thinking of more about uh, how do we just maintain that cow? Uh, how do we get her to have enough body condition to breed back uh, and have enough energy to wean off and lactate to, and wean off a, a heavy calf? Uh, but we really don't want her to do much else than that. Where show cattle are a little different, okay? Um, we have to know our goal. And a lot of times for, in terms of a goal, it's a show or it's a, uh, you know, in, in most Oklahomans case, it's maybe the second uh, Thursday of, of March uh, at the OIE or in the fall, it's at Tulsa. Uh, and you have that end goal date and we're trying to get our animals phenotype to be maximized at that point in time. Uh, and so it's a little different than some of our traditional nutrition uh, kind of concepts and thoughts. And so I think that's important. The other thing we have to do is we have to really evaluate our animal and understand its faults to really know how to feed it. Because there's no question we can do some things that manipulate the phenotype of our animal uh, and really get them to an ideal point. But I may be biased in saying this, but I think the really good feeders in the country are really good evaluators. Uh, and so it may be as easy as, as these two animals I've put up here. You know, on the left, we have this short horn heifer and on the right, we have uh, a crossbred steer. Uh, and so there's obviously major consideration differences between, you know, the two sexes of animals. But even when we take uh, uh, two animals within the same breed or, or same uh, division, uh, we can do a lot of different things to those animals and how we feed them. The pair of short horn heifers on the left, we're not going to feed those two heifers the same. Uh, in from a phenotype standpoint, some things that I see are maybe the heifer on the top. She's quite a bit deeper bodied. She's quite a bit further along in her condition versus the one on the bottom that's shallower, skinnier, and things like that. We're going to do some things differently uh, to, to try to keep those heifers uh, more towards the middle, I suppose. And then on the right, this pair of show steers. Uh, you know, the one on the top, he looks like a shorter body, deeper bodied, heavy muscled calf. And then the one on the bottom is kind of a longer, shallower, leaner type steer. And so the, the, the type of energy that we're going to provide those two calves is quite a bit different. And so I provide these very, very drastic differences here to demonstrate to you that um, you have to understand your calf. You have to be honest with yourself and you have to know what your goals are. And so that's a little challenging if you're not a trained evaluator uh, like, like some of us. And, uh, but you don't have to be a, a master show judge uh, to know what's happening in the show ring, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause there. And I present this slide uh, to a lot of uh, my classes and uh, uh, go ahead and pop in the chat and I'll see if they, they, they jump up here. But what do you guys think these pictures have in common? Hair products. Hair products, some of them. Mark, did you ever have any hair like this? The, the gentleman on the bottom right? I would, no, I would not have. I did. Kirk, Kirk yeah, that would have been for his I, era. You know, there's, there's several things we can say these pictures have in common. I mean, somebody may say they're bad life choices uh, as, as one thing. You know, for me, I'll always be a part of... Uh, the frosted tip generation uh, here, this gentleman in the middle. Uh, but, but really what these are, they are trends. And just like there's trends in, in the, the type of hair um, that, that people decide to style their, their selves as, uh, there's trends in the livestock industry. And so to really know where we're going, I guess you have to know a little bit of, of where we've been. Uh, and so as we dive into this, uh, uh, this is a little bit of a historical review, and I'm going to have Dr. Johnson talk to this. He presents a, a somewhat similar historical review uh, every, every year to our seed stock class. And so 
Uh, you know, this first picture here, go ahead and jump in, Dr. Johnson. Well, the, you're looking at a steer that would have won a major show probably close to a century ago. And is, this is kind of the onset of the era when we were starting to select for cattle that were smaller, earlier maturing, and could get fat on a grass-based diet. And we move forward. And I don't know what all slides you put in here, Parker, but you can see it being taken to the extreme. Uh, that's somewhere in the 50s, I would guess. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at uh, that time when we would pile straw around the legs of the animals and pictures to make them look even lower set. And we're at the full speed ahead point of selection where we're trying to make animals as short coupled as early maturing and as capable of getting fat on a grass-based diet as possible. And absolutely they did. They did that and they created something called dwarfism uh, that uh, majorly wrecked the beef industry. Uh, we were fortunate enough that after the 50s, there was a push uh, to change cattle type. Uh, and, and this is something that's very near and dear to Dr. Johnson's heart. Uh, this was 1969 at the Chicago International. Yeah. You've got uh, on the right, or to my right, as I look at this, you've got Dr. Tadashek with Great Northern, that he made the national champion Angus Bull because that was the biggest, leanest bull in the Angus show in Chicago that year. And then you have got Dr. Don Good, another one of my mentors during my PhD. He made a crossbred steer champion in Chicago that same year. And that is an Angus Charlotte cross steer that was called Conoco with Dr. Good in the background there. And again, that was the thickest, leanest steer. I was personally not there at that show, Parker. But uh, that was the thickest, leanest, and one of the first crossbred steers, I think, to, to win a major national show, if he not the first. Was. He was the I'm first say, like, On that Conoco steer, I mean, now, I mean, granted, there's some changes there, but for being that long ago, and then the other thing you got to realize is like, no, he was lean, but they also shaved the belly hair off. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that, I mean, that's not, a horrible calf, you know what I mean? Even in just for just a look, you know what I mean, on one. I mean, that picture yeah. always amazes me because you know what, you see them ones that are belly high and in straw and, and like them ones are jammed up like that. But I mean, you know, I can actually, and maybe I'm wrong, but I, you know, if I think, well, you know, in today's, I mean, yeah, there'd be some changes there, but that right. one's not horrible. It's a shame, Kirk that we couldn't stay there. Uh, like everything in the, the industry, we were pretty good in 1969. These were acceptable cattle, yeah. uh, but trends happen. People okay. make mistakes. It gets worse from there. There you and go. We had the 80s. Well, well, the trend that it began is, is we knew that we needed bigger, leaner cattle because commercial cattle finishing and the consumption for grain finished beef was off the hook. And so we needed bigger, later maturing cattle to take advantage of what consumer preference was. Oh yeah. Now I included these two pictures of these calves because they have uh, they're they're near and dear to Kirk's art here. Tell us about uh, this steer you rode up you uh, you fit at the National Western that was champion. Yeah, I come from Southern Iowa, um, and I was from Sheraton, Iowa, so kind of came out of my backyards. Um, uh, anyway, end up sold, selling to a. Uh, Websack family in Colorado and and I mean they didn't have anybody to clip him and, and I'd really never been out of I, I kind of just mainly did work locally I'd never really been out of state or out you know uh, no way to the National Western or something like that well anyway this guy he might he the, where the breeder ended up giving him my name but hey there's a kid back our way that that does some clipping around you out of call so he calls me and anyway so anyway uh I'd never flown so I was like man I'm gonna to get to fly, and then I get to go to the National Western. That's cool. And um, anyway, but he had five key bulls also, and he said he'd give me. This is like the fine. I, this is probably not even a relevant. But anyway, but he said he'd give me hundred dollars a head to clip those five key bulls, which I thought was like holy cow. And then I'm getting to go to fly, and I'm getting to go to the National Western. Well, anyway, and, and he says also my daughter, if he he goes, uh, if I think you're good enough. Um, I'll let you clip on her steer and uh, 
anyway, then he just kind of popped off and said, you know, if, if that thing get, wins, he goes, I'll just give you 10% on, on top of all that. And I was like, man, that steer must not be worth the crap. But anyway, and he doesn't look very good today. But anyway, but to make a long story short, I, uh, I still didn't get the flight because he bought me a train ticket. and I rode the train, uh, loaded, I, I boarded in Osceola, Iowa, and I rode the train to, to the Nash Western, well, actually out there at uh, Fort Morgan. And, you know, Absolutely. That's just crazy. The times have changed. And, uh, you know, like the, the, the push for these kind of bigger, leaner cattle uh, that happened in 1969 just continued to the 80s. Yeah. We had these. I could have included pictures of people standing on top of uh, uh, of bales of straw and things like that. But uh, well, that steer on the left one. I mean, it's a steer called Jr. and Lautner's raised him. Um, in fact, that's Wayne Lautner right there. I, I, I'm at the back of him there, but you'll see how tall that thing is. But anyway, um, he won the Iowa State Fair World Steer Show. He won the Nebraska State Fair, and he won the Dallas State Fair. Yeah. So, that, I mean, you could all go, all, I mean, that, that, that's the way it was back then. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the 80s, they told their tale and, and cattle got too big and too lean and we had problems with things like quality grade. Yeah. Uh, and so we had to change. And so I kind of make a big jump here, but uh, I include this slide of, of kind of where we're at today. Uh, and I've included some pretty influential cattle that I think uh, kind of gets you an idea of, of the trend we're still pushing for. Uh, we've probably moderated size and we've stayed pretty consistent on it. Uh, the top left steer, the black one, you'll see a, a, a smiling Dr. Johnson in the background there. That was his champion steer, Fort Worth. Uh, you tell how much bone, muscle, body, and, uh, and stoutness that calf have. He was uh, impressive. On the breeding heifer side, uh, the, the Charlet heifer up in the top right was one of the, the very influential Charlet heifers uh, that was shown by, by his daughters as well uh, that uh, won uh, uh, everything in the Charlet breed. And you can tell how fresh she is in her condition, but how much body uh, and substance she still has. Uh, a, a bull called Brokers on the bottom that was uh, extremely uh, relevant. And then the steer that just won the Cattlemen's Congress. And so I show all these pictures to say that we are trying to add as much body, as much thickness, as much hair, and as much bone into cattle, probably as we, we really can. Uh, and so if we have that kind of assumption uh, and understand that, I think that's important as we start this discussion about nutrition. All right. And uh, I all the time, and I'll, I'll take a little bit of a pause here, but I ask my, my beef class, I ask my judging team this, but why do you think a, a beef cow or beef cattle operations will likely never become uh, the swine industry? Uh, why will they not be vertically integrated? Um, and I encourage you to think about that a little bit. And this is really the heart of, of why we do what we do. Uh, and, you know, a lot of kids will, will say, ah, oh, it's because um, their, their size, things like that. Uh, and and they'll, they'll often be close, but, but not right. And I encourage you to really think about it. The reason that is, is because beef cattle are ruminant animals. Uh, a ruminant animal is very effective at converting fibrous sources uh, like grass, uh, pasture into protein. Uh, and so I think we got to remember that uh, at the beginning. Uh, they, were, they were put on this earth to be able to harvest uh, forage in areas of the U.S. or, or the world that uh, cannot grow crops and convert that into protein. Uh, and so I show this slide to, to my nutrition class. Uh, this is just the schematic of a, of a ruminant animal. Uh, and what you'll notice is that that rumen sets before any of the small intestine or any of the intestinal sites. And, and so when we think about nutrition of a beef cow, that is, that is one of the most important concepts. And it's because of this, no matter what we feed that beef cow, that rumen is going to alter it and turn it into a different set of products uh, for the most part. Okay, so in a sense, we're really feeding, uh, feeding the bugs or the microorganisms in that rumen, uh, which then they are putting out a product 
for our beef cow. And so whether it's uh, we're feeding a starch source, a fiber source, uh, they're gonna, those microorganisms are gonna convert that into volatile fatty acids. And that's really where the energy is gonna come from. If we're feeding a protein, those microorganisms are gonna convert those amino acids into things like urea uh, and other things and, and create microbial protein. Uh, and if we feed things like fats and we're trying to feed unsaturated fats, the rumen converts those fats into saturated uh, fats. And so I'm not wanting you, I'm not gonna quiz you over uh, rumen or fermentation pathways. I just think this is important to know that yes, uh, if, if you're a swine feeder, uh, you're thinking about the different amino acids and all these different things that you're gonna have in your feed. It doesn't necessarily work in beef cattle because what we put into the rumen a lot of times gets altered into something differently. So uh, the outline of the remainder of this discussion, I think is really going to address these three topics, which are three questions that uh, are most commonly asked. You ask Kirk at any of his uh, seminars or presentations, this is what people want uh, ask a lot. Well, what should we feed? How much of it should we feed? Uh, and when should we feed it? Or how often should we feed it? And so that's really where I want to dive into things. So question one, relative to, to what to feed. There's a lot of different choices here. And, uh, you know, there's, there's things we're going to talk about from the complete feed, um, the, the mix-it-yourself type feeds. But if you're going to select a feed and you've evaluated your animal and you know what you need to change, there are some considerations you need to take into fact, and that's how much energy is going to be in that feed stuff. And so what do I mean by energy? And I know if you get your feed tag, uh, there's nothing on there that says energy. You get things like protein, fat, fiber, uh, and then maybe some of your trace minerals. There's no energy. I encourage you, if you can get something like a net energy for gain, uh, that can be very beneficial. But you can really look at uh, the composition of the diet. How much starch products are in, in that feed, like corn. Corn would be an exceptional starch product. Um, how much fat is in that, uh, that feed as well? Uh, and that's really going to tell you uh, what kind of gain you're going to get out of your animal. Um, you may not want to have a feed that's high in energy uh, when you're feeding a really easy fleshing Angus heifer uh, that, that's probably a little fat Ideally, you're not going to want to put a lot of corn or fat in her. But if you have that kind of leaner, harder doing steer uh, that you need to push along, you may want more energy uh, and more fat in it uh, to get them to an end point. So energy is uh, one of the major considerations. Protein is the second that I'm going to talk about. As I showed you that in, in cattle nutrition, it's not like pigs where we uh, really have to consider a ton of you know, amino acid requirements and, uh, you know, feeding different levels of those. Um, in theory, uh, you know, a beef cow receiving uh, a well-balanced diet will produce enough microbial protein to meet their needs. So literally their, their microorganisms are protein themselves uh, and it'll lead to the growth of the animal. Now there's been some work in talking about rumen undegradable protein and bypass protein. In theory, um, you need to just provide a, a growing animal, depending on what stage they're in, an appropriate amount. Uh, you know, a young calf, we can be thinking of, you know, 14 to 15 percent protein. Uh, in our, you know, yearling uh, feedlot steer, we can be much lower, uh, around 12 to 13. Um, if we feed excess protein. There's an energy cost associated with that. Uh, and cattle can actually lose weight uh, when you feed excess protein. And if you feed not enough protein, uh, they're going to uh, have some rumen issues and they're not going to perform as well also. Third consideration, which I'm going to have some, some of these guys jump in, is the inclusion of fiber okay, uh, in our diets. Dr. Johnson, how do you at, at your house uh, and what type of hay do you provide to your breeding heifers? We believe in feeding a good quality prairie hay. 
and it gets back to what your fundamental stuff about beef cattle being a ruminant animal and uh, God made them to digest fiber and the most tried and true fiber product that we believe in is just feeding a prairie grass hay. I say a good quality. Uh, typically, if we think of baling hay in Oklahoma, I like to feed prairie hay that is baled sometime in late June, maybe early July, depending on the growing year. So it's not too mature. And it is just, it just, I, I don't know what word I'm looking for, but it is the basis of everything we do feeding show heifers or show bulls, uh, irrespective of their age and what other type of ration we've got them on as we grow and develop those cattle. Uh, from the time they're weaned, they've got ad lib prairie grass hay. Now, Mark, I got a question for you. Are you providing that hay uh, for a nutritional value or for them to gain off of? Are you providing it for a fill and room and health standpoint? All the above. Now, we're going to, you know, we'll have calves on a 14% crude protein creep feed up to the point that they're weaned. And, and that's kind of our same show feed, I would say, that we'll keep those cattle on post weaning. And, you know, cattle post weaning, I, not to try to be overly scientific, and I want Kirk's opinion on this too, but we always work off the old five gallon bucket. If you've got a bulky fibrous feed, which, which I believe in a lot of cotton seed hulls, oats, things like that are good for show cattle then if you're somewhere in a ballpark of a five gallon bucket, based on how bulky, how many cotton seed holes, how many oats versus how much cracked corn, you're looking somewhere in a ballpark of 18 to 20 pounds is what that bucket's gonna weigh. So when we're talking about weaned calves, uh, they're not gonna eat 25 pounds a day, maybe quite at that point as you get them on out to yearlings the difference between feeding bulls versus heifers. Uh, they're going to have more appetite. They're going to be, you know, maybe more pounds a day of that. But we've always got them on ad lib prairie hay and trying to adjust accordingly relative to the energy and the crude protein based on where they're at. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I'm going to come back to your question to Kirk on the next slide. But um, most everybody feeding breeding heifers will provide hay uh, to cattle ad libitum or at free choice. Um, and yes, we want them to gain some weight off of that, but the real idea for that is to provide a scratch factor, some long stem forage to maintain room and health. Uh, and, and I know maybe, maybe some of us are experts in, uh, ruminant nutrition on this and others may not, but, um, that rumen, uh, it's part liquid and it's part solids. And it really, uh, for the balance to, uh, uh, to maintain, it requires some forage uh, to make a mat. Uh, and if an animal does not have enough fiber in their diet, uh, things can happen. There can be some issues with, with the health of that room. And we get things like acidosis, uh, which can really, uh, cause an animal to die, I guess, in, in some cases. But also, when we provide uh, additional forages and fiber sources, that rumen microorganism or my, uh, microbial population really grows and expands. So the more fiber you feed to an animal, uh, their rumen gets larger. Uh, and um, if you feed a, an animal all concentrate, their, their rumen shrinks. And so, if we're wanting to achieve things like more depth of body, more center body fill, um, providing extra forage uh, is a way to do that. Um, not only for health, but it can improve the, the phenotype of the animal as well. We talked a little bit about this, but uh, what makes a good hay? Uh, Dr. Johnson, uh, you said you feed a, a prairie hay. Uh, and to somebody listening that doesn't talk about you know, show cattle, if you said a good hay, high quality hay, they're probably thinking about an alfalfa. Why would you not do that? And why do, and, uh, versus a, uh, a, a, just a prairie hay kind of uh, cow hay, I suppose you could say. 
relating it back to something you said a minute ago, the prairie hay is not going to be extremely high in protein. It's not going to be extremely high in energy or the digestibility makes the rate of passage about where you want to keep it. And if we get into, and this is my issue with even a Bermuda grass hay, in some cases we can get into Bermuda grass that's had a lot of fertilizer, gets to be really high quality and almost takes our rate of passage to that same point that a good quality alfalfa might. And so we're trying to keep them full, keep them happy and keep the rate of passage about where you want it. Excellent. The last thing I put on this slide that you need to consider on, on what you're feeding is we need to balance our ration uh, to, to meet the requirements for trace minerals and vitamins. And this sounds like a pretty simple thing, but uh, there are certain things that cattle need on, on the trace mineral side that make all the functions work. And so I encourage you just to make sure that the requirements are, are met on those things. Next slide's where I'm going to have kind of Kirk jump into it here, but uh, um, this is where there's probably the most confusion when it comes to feeding cattle. And that's uh, around the extras, the supplements, uh, all the things that you can, uh, you can put on feed. And, uh, you know, I have these kind of three different topics here that, you know, really where the supplements are centered around. I encourage each one of you, uh, yes, if you want to feed a supplement, there are certain ones that at, at the right time uh, can really benefit an animal. Uh, it can blend well with a complete feed, but you need to know what you're, what you're feeding, what the goal of it is, and what it's really doing. And make sure it's not just, uh, you know, foo-foo dust, as, as Dr. Lawman, I got to get that in for him. Uh, you got to make sure you're, you're feeding a little more than maybe a bag of sand or, or some unicorn dust. And so um, you, you really find a lot of supplements kind of in these three categories things that are molasses based or fat based that are going to increase palatability. There's most of the complete show cattle feeds are including things like Tasco uh, that are, you know, increase hair growth through uh, vasodilation. Um, and then there's things like uh, performance modifiers like ionophores, yeast cultures. Um, and then, you know, some of our growth promotants such as beta agonists or, or antibiotics, which we're going to just briefly cover relative to uh, antibiotic re uh, residue avoidance in just a little bit. But uh, I, I put a, a quote in here from Kirk and he's going to touch on it. Uh, but adding a bunch of supplements are not going to make up for a bad feed. And uh, you can kind of touch on that, Kirk. Well, and I think, you know, supplements, like you said, are good. And I think there's a time for them. But you know what, if, uh, also, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know what I mean? I mean, if things are going good and, you know, just cause, you know, some people just, you know, and then the other thing is you can feed too many supplements where there's not enough room, room for feed. And, and to me, I, I'm gonna say this, you know, I think you gotta keep your supplements at a minimal. Um, I think, you know, not all of them have, have the same, uh, if you are gonna feed a supplement, not all of them are, are gonna have the same, um, you know, ones that you're going to use. And so uh, whether you're trying to, you know, feed something for soundness or you're feeding a supplement for uh, body or you're feeding a supplement, you know, to burn fat off, you know, there's all kinds of, you know, there's supplements to, to um, you know, to um, level and, and to me, uh, uh, keep the uh, pH in the gut to me regulated. So there's all kinds of stuff out there. But I'm just saying is, like I said, uh, you can't just go, throwing a bunch of stuff because you got to leave room for feed. And then the other thing is, is I think supplements work really well on good quality feed, but I know there's a lot of supplements dump on a lot of feed that's not so good, you know? And so to me, um, yeah, there's supplements are good. I mean, you know, we use them and, um, uh, but we have to also be careful. You know what? I mean, we got to pick and choose what we feel like. Well, basically you get your priority. You got to prioritize what's the most, important thing that you need to improve at this moment. And then, then we're going to dwell on that. It seems like we can't just, oh, you know, we need more 
thickness or we need fat off and we need uh, you know, all of a sudden you're dumping all this stuff. It's almost like you almost got to prioritize a little bit and, and go from there. And, and then, so to me, and it's like anything else, um, I'm, I'm more conscious about the, the good feed and, and, and hay. I just think uh, those, I mean, it is basic and it is not, I mean, sometimes it's uh, uh, not glamorous. I'm just talking about good feed, good hay. I mean, the protocol is pretty simple. And, but I think those work and you know what, I mean, so, I mean, that's my own opinion here. And yeah. I'm just sure. well, that's us. no, you can, you're definitely right. And, uh, you know, even from a, a pocketbook standpoint, you can get up to adding, you know, one, two, three dollars, even more 10, you know, $5 a day in supplements, if you're not careful. Uh, and, and sometimes you get to where you're, you're, you're adding things and they don't work together. You're really counteracting what you're doing. Well, uh, and so a lot okay. of things we say this, uh, you know, we're not uh, salespeople for any specific product, uh, but a lot of these supplements are tough because there's not a lot of research behind them. Uh, and, and we as o Oklahoma State Extension like to talk about things that uh, are backed by science and research. And maybe on some of these show cattle uh, supplements, there's, there's not a lot of that. Uh, and, you know, you have to, sometimes you're putting your faith in, into a sales pitch as well there, but uh, some things do work and some things don't. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you gotta, you gotta believe in what you're doing. Hey, uh, uh, Dr. Henley, I want to say this, that I think that gets back to your goal because, you know, I was doing a clinic in Nebraska and, and there's a guy that had two kids there. Uh, he managed a feedlot. He said, you know, I want to manage, I want to teach my kids when it came to this feeding thing. I want to teach my kids to feed out of market steer as cheap as I can. You know what I mean? Cause that's what I do every day. I want to teach my kids that. Well, when it comes to feed and supplements, you know what, that, that's fine. That's, that's an awesome goal. I mean, I'm not taking away that that's like way awesome, but when it comes to the goal and the cost, that, that's where I'm, I'm just saying is he's probably not going to be happy with, my goal, and I probably can't make what I want to happen on his goal. And so to me, you know, that's where that, that goal thing factors into your, your program all the way down, you know, even, you know, to feed. So absolutely. Anyway. Absolutely. Well, as we kind of transition here now to kind of the second topic of how much to feed. So we've identified that we need to have a, a balanced ration. Uh, we need to have a good quality feed with ingredients that are fresh, uh, and we need to have it, uh, you know, mixed appropriately as well. Uh, but then we get to the, the question of really how much do we feed? Uh, and Dr. Johnson said on the breeding heifer side, when you're feeding these very fibrous, bulky type rations, uh, he feeds more on a volume standpoint, okay, versus... Kirk here, who, uh, you know, has, has fed both of these, but specifically on the steer side, where we're, we're trying to push gain a little bit more, uh, we're, we're trying to uh, manage weight, and you probably feed them a little bit more on a pounds or weight standpoint. Can you speak to that, Kirk? Well, yeah, and uh, yeah, like you said, we do do both. I do think uh, a lot of times a heifer is a little bit more, I don't want to say trickier, but I'm just saying is that a steer, because on a steer, it seems like, you know, we're moving forward. We have uh, weights, uh, we have end goals, we have days on feed. So we can do the math and you know what, we kind of figure out, you know, at, at two pounds per day of gain, we're, we're feeling pretty good about that. Threes and up probably means, hey, we're gonna have to push, you know, if we're, if we're looking at a one pound gain to make our end goal look right, well, then we're looking at, a, you know, at, at on holding. So that's a whole different program in itself. I do know that when it comes to steers and heifers, I mean, the math doesn't lie. If you'll do the math and you'll weigh those steers and you'll project those, I guarantee you it will tell you how to feed. On the heifers, I feel like it's, it's um, you know, we need them things to gain, but there is a, it's all visual, but it's almost, to me, a little bit more marked I'm not sure if you're good, but, you know, it's a lot more visual because they say don't get them too fat, but guess what? The heifer that wins is pretty good shape. So there's a, there's a fine line you trend there, you know what I mean? And, and you know, we use the word fresh and, and this and that, but I'm just saying, 
that's a hard line to to maintain long term. And, you know, and so sometimes we got to, to come back and then re go back there. I'm just saying, you know, that's a totally different game there. And you know, as far as uh, how much to feed, you know, two to three percent is what we figure on the steers. Uh, that's where your math weighing these steers every month, you know, or, or whatever. It lets you know kind of, but they don't have to. I'm just saying is if you're a little bit under 2% in your consumption, but your steer is gaining 2.8 or 3, hey, you've got a good converter there. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I'd say don't freak out. You know what I mean? I mean, life's good. If you gain them doing that, I mean, I think the math will tell you what to do. Now, yeah. we talked about the five-gallon bucket. We weigh our feed. I mean, I mean, we, we, we use a scale on everything in our place. We weigh our feed just because – it, multiple people are feeding in our house at times, depending on, you know, whether we have an intern or, or our family. And I'm just saying, so a scoop or a five gallon bucket or a bucket or whatever, it just, uh, you know, what this way, if something leaves feed, we weigh it, figure out how much they're leaving. If we want to up the feed, we'll up it a pound, and then wait a few days and then go another pound. So it's pretty calculated here. And so we use a scale just because it takes away a lot of, uh, things that could mess up, so to speak. So that's that's our place. So absolutely. And Kirk, relative to that, uh, you talk about we. This kind of comes back to our goals. And yeah. I put the second point here of every calf is different, uh, and this is important. In market market steers, we are not feeding to an end weight. We are feeding to an end point composition. Sure. Uh, if if 1,250 pounds on a moderate short coupled frame steer results in seven to eight tenths of fat, that calf is too heavy. Right. Um, it's like and, the old saying goes, they're all not going to fit in the same box. You exactly. I mean? I mean, we ultimately want cattle when we show them to be at an appropriate composition. You know, four to five tenths of back fat would be ideal. Um, and so, if, you're, if your frame size of your calf varies on that, you're going to need to target different weights. Uh, and, and so on a market animal, that's extremely important. Every, every calf is different. Okay. Um, Kirk talked a little bit about this, but a good rule of thumb relative to feed is that cattle are somewhere between six and seven pounds of feed to gain one pound. Mm -hmm. Cattle differ. Uh, you know, they can be on way opposite ends of that uh, that feed to gain ratio there. But if you want to calculate out and think about some gains, that's a good rule of thumb. To hey, put Parker, in can I add something here? Yes. Just, I, I made reference to the five gallon bucket, but, and I, I think this is really important and it relates back to some stuff we talked about earlier that we're not always filling that five gallon bucket. And, and we are pretty specific on how much or how much feed they're actually getting every day. And a lot of our heifers in particular, I would say that we tend to keep them on a same type of 14% feed post weaning. But by the time they get to be a year of age, they may be getting the same volume of feed relative to approximately what goes in a five gallon bucket, but there's no longer any cereal grain in it, something like corn. And we're down to a point where we're basically feeding them fiber and fluff and things to keep them full and not continually feeding them energy. And that kind of gets back to this point of that fine line we're trying to get to the yeah. optimum degree of bloom and keeping them fresh versus the right size and right amount of growth. And so relating that back to what you said at the beginning, being able to evaluate your animal is really important relative to that end goal. Absolutely. Uh, one last question I'll ask there is, how do you handle, you guys handle when there's feed left over uh, in, a, in a bunk? And how does that impact what you put out the, the next day? We pick it up. And I'm going to say, why do we pick it up? I mean, in out here, what I, I'm more concerned about, we pick it up. Not only, I don't want something to come up there and, and uh, you know, especially if there's more than one pin, uh, you know, I'm talking about little calves, like we, we're, we're starting to, you know, get into these sale calves now, but yeah, we pick it up. One reason why is I don't want something to come up there and, and then, uh, you know, I want them all to clean up within an hour. That, that, you know, we check troughs after an hour and, and they need to be cleaned up. We, I worry and concerned about birds. 
I mean, if we leave feet out there in the trough, I mean, now we got birds in there, we got bird crap in there. And I mean, I just, the coccidiosis factor and just, you know, just it's nasty. I mean, you know what I mean? And I just, so that's kind of, that's our, our point on that. We want to keep them aggressive. And like I said, I, I don't want to feed the birds, man. So anyway, so. Uh. <laughs> we, and I would say the same thing. We, we want to keep them hungry. We want them to have an aggressive appetite, come to the bunk. And if it is a time and an animal's life when you're trying to push them or yeah. get them to gain more, put on more bloom, if you get them past that point where they're not cleaning up their feed, then we just scale back the amount of feed. Right. Right. And then and that's one, less, good one, one less scoop goes in the next day. Right. And we've had them like where you're rock long there. And, 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 you know, maybe that is a, a like say a five gallon, just so you will use the five gallon. That's five gallon bucket feed. I mean, that, that, that forehead has been eating that you know, every day, no problem. Then all of a sudden we'll run into a deal where all of a sudden they start leaving some and you're like, I, you know, I don't know why, but then like you said, we'll back them down, you know what I mean? And get them kind of clean them back up and then we'll try to graduate back up to where we were. So I think I reading that, I think looking at the manure and looking at the feed troughs is something that you need to be looking at when you're out there feeding cattle. Sure. For sure. Um, I think that leads us into our next point here of how often to feed. Uh, and, and it goes back to my initial two slides of really about the, the, the rumen of the beef cow. Uh, in, in beef cattle, a routine is extremely important, okay? Um, that the microorganism population uh, in the rumen loves a routine. They do not like radical changes. They don't like changes in the environment uh, and they don't like changes in what they are eating. Uh, and so that's why ultimately you hear people say, feed them twice a day at the exact same times, uh, equal times apart from each other. Uh, and that allows for the, the, the rumen to stay healthy uh, and, uh, and, and keep working. Cattle, cattle need a routine. If we can stress one thing here uh, is, is get and set your time. And if you get your calves home and you're a, uh, a night owl and you don't like to wake up till nine in the morning, well, you should feed at nine and night uh, and get into that routine. If you're gonna feed every day at five and five, uh, you need to be consistent with that. Uh, relative to changing feed constantly, um, if you do walk out there and, and Kirk said, and you evaluate their manure and one's a little runny or uh, one's a little firm on the other end, or they left some feed, don't make big changes. Uh, I think in the feed lot, they, they don't like to make more than a 10% change uh, to any one day. Okay. And I think that's a good rule of thumb with cattle as well. If you are going to put out, uh, you know, uh, 10 pounds of feed, you know, I wouldn't change from one day to the next more than a pound. Uh, and, and you need to stay very, very consistent there. Um, and ultimately, don't make big radical changes. Evaluate your animals every day, um, but have a goal in mind, keep things simple, and keep it progressing forward. Uh, you guys have any comments relative to that? Um, yeah, I can, you know, I think on that routine, I think when uh, you get to feeding, uh, feeding cattle when you want to, I think they get to eating when they want to. It just kind of don't work very good. I think, um, like I said, I, we say the same time every day within an hour is kind of a rule of thumb, you know, I mean, just because every now and then, you know, we can be running later on something or whatever, but we're pretty, we're pretty dead on on that routine thing. I mean, that we live by that. We've been late to, to, our, our family Christmases because of that routine. You know what I mean? I'm just saying we live in, and breathe that pretty much constantly. Uh, on changing the feed, you know, I think you got to let a change work. A lot of times people make a change and then all of a sudden two days later, uh, well, you know what I mean? I don't, yeah, I think you got to, if you do make a change, I think you got to run out there a couple of weeks at least, uh, you know what I mean? And, and give it a chance. I mean, I think, I think the cattle, I think if you, if you make a change, and you give it long enough, I think the cattle will tell you what to do. I really do. I think they'll, they'll tell you whether it's working or not working. And then on keeping it simple and, and I think all that, one thing that I'd recommend 
because we all have them, is take a picture of your cattle once a month, especially, I mean, you 4-H and FFA kids and, and well, breeders, anybody. But I mean, if you're trying to add belly or you're trying to add depth or volume or fat or condition or, or whatnot, take a picture with your cell phone once a month. And I'm just saying it's because there is something about being, there is, barn blind is a true thing. I mean, it really is. And I'm just saying, I think that keeps it irrelevant and I think it keeps it dead on. And I think a picture don't lie. And a lot of times, you know, you're out there every day. And I just think if you're looking at this month and you roll down to the next month, you know, hey, you know what? We are making a difference. This is working. I think that helps you. So anyway, that's just my thought there quickly. Doc, I'll be in, uh, Dr. Johnson, I'll be interested to in see what you have on that also. Now, I don't have a lot to add. I, what you guys have said makes a good point. We had a question that looked like popped up on the chat about feeding once a day. And I think the routine, the, the consistency of room and pH, feeding twice a day within a pretty narrow range of time. And we try to do it within two hours, so between five and seven in the morning, between five and seven at night just for the sake of consistency and the whole rate of passage room and pee, everything just seems to work better if we can do that. Uh, and, and I, I bring up something, we're talking about feeding cattle, but I always hear my friends that feed show barrows talk about how rapidly they'll change and respond to feed. And I'm always somewhat envious of that because when you're feeding cattle, it is a long-term thing. And if you haven't been on the same feed for 30 or 60 days, you're really not seeing what you're getting there. So yeah, you do have need to have consistency for yeah, no. the product and the time you're feeding it. Good point. I apologize, I missed that question, but uh, you know, the one time a day, uh, what really can happen is uh, you're gonna get into some health issues. Uh, if an animal will gorge themselves, and then their stomach will be empty and you get in these very wide ranges in pH of their rumen. Uh, and then if they do get into some acidosis when their stomach's real uh, empty and they eat a bunch, then you're gonna have some, some problems with intake long-term. Uh, I'll get back to Sarah's question that she asked a little bit ago. I missed that um, about hay as well, but uh, for, for the factor of time, I know this is something that we could talk about for days uh, between the three of us, uh, but, you know, we do have just an hour here, and I don't expect everybody to become an expert, um, but we do definitely want you to leave here uh, with a few kind of general thoughts, and you know, I think it's important just to have good animal husbandry, uh, provide clean water, provide a clean uh, space for the animal to live in. We are a lot of times asking more of a show calf than we are just of a commercial animal. They've got to do more. Uh, so we need to take the extra step and make sure the environment uh, is favorable for them. Uh, we talked about this feed a balanced ration and uh, a good roughage source. Um, what we call that roughage source, really what we're trying to feed there is to maintain health, a good you know, a forage with some stem in it so we can get some scratch factor. Uh, we want it to be palatable um, and uh, we want, want it to be baled appropriately with no mold and things like that. And we want the cattle to like it. Uh, get into a routine. That's one of the major kind of, you know, points of this discussion uh, that we want you to have. Um, this kind of leads into what we're going to uh, discuss in the next two weeks. Uh, but you need to have a good relationship with your veterinarian. Um, all this stuff from a nutrition standpoint that we talk about only works if you have proper animal health. Uh, and so you need to vaccinate your calves. You need to deworm them on a, on a scheduled basis, uh, whether that be you know once every 30 days. And so we didn't maybe talk about this, but it's kind of a, an important step to really making nutrition work. Uh, it, with show cattle. Uh, and then the last point here, and, and it goes to some of the things that Kirk talked, but be honest with yourself. We're all barn blind. Uh, we all think that our kids' animals or the animals we raised are the best. And if you don't, uh, you, you need to do something else uh, because uh, you need to buy a different animal. And, but you got to be honest with yourself and, and you got to understand your project's faults 
how you can make a change, if we can make a change, uh, and try to just do your best you can. Hey, Mark, can I, I mean, uh, yeah, go ahead, Kirk. No, I mean, uh, I, what I want to try, I just put touch there is like, we live in a, in a technical world. And I'm just saying is that if you don't understand, I mean, if you're needing help or some guidance, I mean, reach out to your extension, your uh, agents, your FFA advisors, your breeders. I mean, there, there's, uh, there's plenty of people within the industry. I guarantee you, if you send a picture or a video or, I mean, there's so many sources that you can reach out to, to me to get help. And I think that's, I think that's huge. And I mean, and I'm going to say this, I mean, don't think there hasn't been a time that, that I haven't called uh, Parker or him to me or, or, or Mark, or I've talked to different nutritionists and different, uh, you know, different people within the industry. Like, look, we got this going on, you know, I, and, and, you know, it's one of the things that, you know, trying to figure it out. And I'm just saying that that's just the world we live in, but that's, that's a good thing about it because we can reach out to different channels and get some guidance and help. And I think that's really important. And I, I remember when my girls started, I think Kirk got tired of me sending him text messages, no, feed, feeding and nutrition advice for our projects. <laughs> but one other, one other person, when you buy a calf, I think it's really helpful to talk to who you bought it from. What have they been feeding it? Obviously you liked what it looked like. It was, had to have been in the right plane of nutrition for it to appeal to you to buy. So ask them. And, and a lot of times when we sell show calves, we'll send a bag of feed with them to make that transition and kind of talk about what was in it. So I, I think your source for the calf is often a good place to start too, as far as what they've been eating, where that feed gets made and why that is what you're feeding them then versus what you may be feeding them three to six months down the road. Oh yeah. And I'm sure you guys do. We get lots of pictures and videos from, you know, people like, you know, Hey, you know, can you help me here? Or, you know, I mean, or, or whatnot. And that's just, that's, that's, you know, what, if, when I was a little kid and you told me there was a day that you could video or take a picture out in the lot, you know what I mean? Out here in the, in the runs and send it to somebody and then have them tell you, you know, what they thought. I mean, I would have thought, you know, that's like, that's like moon stuff and they're landing on the Mars or something today. So it's like, you know, it's, it's crazy. So, it, but it's a good crazy and you know what, it keeps us all moving forward and we all do it. So um, that's a good thing. No question. We definitely want to be your source for information here and uh, feel free to, you know, contact any of your extension specialists or send us uh, questions you have. Um, another good question came in uh, for cold weather uh, adjustment of feeding. Uh, some of you probably just went through that. Um, but as I mentioned, a lot of times weather, you know, causes some, some upset. And so what people will What's good is to provide and you know, pull back a little bit on the feed, uh, the, the concentrate, the corn, any kind of starchy types uh, products in your feed and put out more hay. Um, any, anytime you can you know, make it uh, a more fibrous based diet around weather changes is always going to be better for the health of, of that animal. Dr. Henley, I wanted to say, I mean, like we were breaking ice in the you know, pastures and stuff like that and automatic waters and stuff like that. And I couldn't believe like the, the bird manure on the, on those waters, you know what I mean? Like, you know, just where, cause they're, they're, they're looking for it. So I'm just saying this might not be a bad time. Like you said, clean water, that's huge. You know what I mean? That, that affects your everything. So to me, I, I think that was awful good that you had that up there. I had the, the one question about what does our panel think about if we're if we're living in a an area where maybe our traditional prairie grass hay isn't available? Um, what are our, what are other options there? Yeah, um, I would say um, try to find a a hay or a uh, fiber source that has some stem to it. It doesn't necessarily have to be hay, but you don't want something extremely high quality. Uh, by that, I mean high in protein, very easily digestible. Um, so, you, but you don't want something like a straw either that they're not going to eat or uh, is not very palatable. Um, and so there's, you know, 
everywhere has fiber growing, uh, probably, you know, anywhere in the country. And so I would look through in, in the horse world, if you're, we're, we're really kind of looking for what's called a medium quality hay uh, for, yeah. for cattle, uh, whereas horses are in the high quality stuff. And so uh, if you can find something in that range with some, some stem and some a length to it, that's what you're, you want. Kirk, you were looking like you want to jump in. Yeah, I, I would think, you know, like California, you know, that's one state, you know, they, they seem like they've got more, uh, what I'd say, oat hay out there. You know what I mean? And that's really, they, you know, they, a lot of kids will have trouble finding grass hay. You know, maybe, like you said, a horse option. Maybe it's your sale barn. You know, a lot of times they'll get in uh, grass hay. I'm just saying uh, it could be a uh, Sudan. Uh, it could be uh, some of that, um, you know, some of those different hays like that. Um, you know, like I said, uh, yeah, I mean, oat hay, you know, we, we feed, we, we fed oat hay before. I mean, you know, just, but, uh, you know, like I said, alfalfa, well, the problem with the alfalfa is, and I'm just going to be straight, it, it, it promotes bloat on a, on a, on a ration that's, uh, uh, to me, a show ration. And then the other thing is, it'll spike that protein up beyond to where all of a sudden now they'll get loose out the back. So we're, we're, we're dealing with loose stools, we're potential bloating and it's just a, it, it's just not a good deal so I'm just saying that that's dangerous in my mind um, you know and to me I'd, I'd say reach out to others try to I mean I think there's some fiber somewhere I think I think there's some grass hay somewhere it might just take a little bit of looking trying to find it I don't know but anyway that's what I think. Yeah, so Sarah's added, um, she's joining us from New Mexico and um, having done a, a little bit of work in New Mexico, yeah, it can be a little bit more challenging in, in that part of the world. So, you know, wheat hay is a good option. I would maybe try to say is, again, don't get the, the highest quality or the, uh, you know, if you had a, a, a nutrient analysis of it, something that's not so crazy high in protein or maybe not uh, a little bit higher in NDF or ADF, just so again, we're feeding that hay for, for more room and health and fill versus it being easily digestible and, and degradable as we get into problems like Kirk was talking about. Yeah, that, that good quality part of hay, that, that not, not like straw, but not like extreme alfalfa. That's somewhere in the middle is where we seem to want to keep it, regardless of the type of hay, whether it's wheat hay, oat hay, prairie hay, is the thing that I would try to keep in mind. You know, I'll be honest, we are about as picky about our hay as we are the feed. I mean, because we're actually looking for a good, solid, medium quality, long stem hay. That's what we want. And I'm just saying, um, I don't need the horse hay. I don't want the high protein, double fertilized Bermuda hay. I mean, I'm just saying, you know, we are picky about our hay. We just like plain Jane, gray hay, longer stem for the scratch factor. And so I'm like saying, hey, you know, hey, it can be, yeah. I mean, like we, we have to work at finding the right kind of hay here. I'm just going to be truthful. It's something that we, we work at. Yeah, like, like our title discussed today, it's still beef. Let's keep it simple um, and, and find what we need, what we need. So uh, I did uh, want to make sure we brought up one other thing today. Um, I understand it is Dr. Henley's birthday today. Do we have that correct? Yeah. So we want to make sure um, we thank Dr. Henley for being with us today and wish him a happy birthday. Birthday. Dr. John, Dr. Johnson, Mr. Steerwalt, thank you so much. Oh, Dr. Yeah. Biggs, do we want to sing happy birthday to Parker? I would think, come on. No, he, yeah. he mentioned contacting your veterinarian to today, office. so I, I, I probably, I probably owe him a, a pop or something like that for saying be nice to your veterinarian these days. <laughs> so um, I won't torture him with, certainly won't torture him with my singing, that's for sure. So what um, is next week, though, for... Uh, some good discussions. We got two more good weeks of this. 
Excellent. Absolutely. Two more um, coming up, and I think a lot of the things we discussed today lead into that, particularly the comments about clean water, et cetera. Birds, uh, we're right in biosecurity talks all day on that kind of thing, and um, that's what we'll be focusing on as well as transport next week and then followed by animal health uh, at our final session. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, Dr. Henley, did you have anything else? That's it. All right, well, we wanna thank our attendees today and um, hope you'll join us. If you missed last week's recording, you can check that out at beef.okstate.edu. We would ask you, if you have a moment, we do have a survey that should launch at the conclusion of today's presentation for you. Take a moment, it is anonymous. Uh, we won't know who you are, but we want your feedback to know if we're headed in, headed in the right direction. And I think with our attendance today, it's been one of our, our highest so far in the Rancher series. And so I think we're um, doing, doing some of the right things with, with this discussion. So with that, um, we'll, we'll close out for today and uh, thank our presenters uh, yet again. Uh, again, no, no strangers to the show industry. Uh, the, the information you provide is, is invaluable and uh, we, we can't say thank you enough. So with that, hope everybody stays warm. Uh, keep breaking that ice for at least a few more days. Um, I got a new ax for Valentine's Day uh, to break, break ice. So um, I knew I was loved and um, we hope you have a good day and we hope to see you next week. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks.